I'm also still letting people into the waiting room. So I, I'm just, I, I might be a bit distracted. So forgive me. Okay, my name is Mia Foyer. I am a professor here at CCA of sculpture. I'm also teaching the senior projects class. I'm very excited to present uh, our six presenters today who will be talking about their practice. Um, Kelsey So, uh, Ajaya Batnagar, Tamara Yasmin Sobek, Daniela Cruz Perez, Jay Morrison, and Olivia Merck. So that's the order that I was hoping we would go in. I'm going to say it one more time, just so everyone can kind of compute that. It'll be Kelsey first, then we'll go to Ajaya, then we'll go to Tamara, then Daniela, then Jay, and we'll end with Olivia. Does that work for everyone? Fantastic. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is introduce our respondent, Prabha Pilar, and... Um, let me just pull up Prabha's bio. So Prabha, um, oh, and I'm also needing to admit people. Give me one second. All the things. Okay, I think that's, I think I got everybody. Um, okay, so Prabha Pilar is a diaspora Colombian artist and scholar who for the last two decades has presented her critical techno-cultural artworks in museums, galleries, universities, performance festivals, and conferences around the world. She has a PhD in performance studies and a Bachelor of Arts in Intermedia Arts from Mills College. Uh, Prabha also teaches at CCA. So if any of you um, are lucky enough to be in Prabha's class, you you know how wonderful and brilliant she is. So welcome Prabha, thank you so much for responding to our presenters. And I will be keeping time. Presenters, presenters have 10 minutes to present and then Prabha will have 10 minutes to respond. Um, if you go over your 10 minutes, that uh, however long you go over will cut into your response your response time, Prabha's response time, or the sort of post discussion. So I will keep time. I'll let I'll kind of do this or let you know when you hit the two minute or when you have about two minutes left as sort of a um, a nudge to wrap it up. So unless there's any questions, concerns, issues, we're all good. Hi, Prabha. It's wonderful to be here today. Congratulations to everyone. We're so lucky to have you. Um, all right. So we're going to kick things off with Kelsey So. All right. I'll share my screen. Okay. And I will let you know when I start the clock. Can we all see this okay? Perfect. Yes. All right, go for it, Kelsey. Hello, my name is Hebin Kelsey So. Thanks for attending to my BFA conversation. I'm originally from South Korea. I grew up in a loving family of four, including myself. At age 11, when I was getting close to graduating from elementary school, I wanted to explore more than my city and country. So I decided to study abroad. Coming to the U.S. was not what I imagined it would be. I moved to Chicago where my aunt lived and my world was turned upside down. She had become an alcoholic and abused me. On top of that, I also had to deal with racism and constant rejection from the community because of my identity. I was devastated and lost hope. After years of suffering, I was able to escape as much as I was happy to be out. I, was, I still had a lot to deal with. I lost my ability to express myself and had trouble understanding who I was. That was when I discovered art. I used art as a tool to communicate with those around me and myself. As I started to recover from my past, I wanted to use my passion for art to help others who might have had similar experiences as me. I wanted those people to be able to feel heard and included. 
I didn't want anyone to feel what I had felt, isolated and lonely. I am inspired by artists such as Wilm Del Boy, Nam Jun Peck, Catherine O.P., Cass Holman, and Albert Camus. These artists communicate with their viewers through interactivity, simplicity, and playfulness. Each artist constantly questions our perspective and beliefs to ask us if, if what we believe is true or just society teach, teaches. Nam Jun Pak, in particular, is an artist I deeply admire. Through his work, he desired to create connection with others, create community no matter where you are, and give artists constant challenges about what it means to be an artist. We better keep our eyes on this banana. She's wearing running shoes. This was the first thing I heard from two cops as they escorted me to the verification room when I arrived at the Chicago airport. The yellow fever talks about Asians living in the US. As a Korean living in the US, I felt discomfort during the transition between people's perspectives from past and today. From despising my culture and appearance to obsessing over it, I became confused. I used taxidermia as a main frame for this work to represent the feeling of my identity being objectified by others, almost feeling like a trophy or souvenirs for others. The board of the piece contains the color of the skin of the banana, while the banana itself has lost its color. The other peel on the ground represents other Asian countries, specifically South and Southeast Asia, which are often being ignored and looked down on. Margaret is the name of the flower I use for this work, which means true love or true happiness. This work was created during the pandemic. I had to go back home and stay there due to the COVID. And during that time, I was able to take a break, rest, and look back at myself through everything. After many traumatic moments while living in the US, I wasn't able to fully express my emotions and felt stuck if my feelings became known. But after spending months with my family in person for the first time in a while, I learned that I had to express my feelings to heal and truly understand myself. There is nothing wrong with expressing. Instead, it is the beauty of life. The true hero was created after a long conversation with my brother. We asked ourselves, what can we do to help the earth? After discussing possibilities, we agreed on one answer. Humans should all die. All the problems of the world are intertwined and life is in black and white. I felt hopeless for our planet and our humanity. To share my answer with others, I decided to say my words through a performance. I created a heart-shaped coffin and dragged it into the woods. As hopeless I was at the beginning of the performance, throughout the walk, I had many realizations that gave me hope. Over the years, I had become interested in interactive art. The comfort zone is a series of sculptural furniture. While in furniture class, I wanted to bring comfort to both body and mind. This first piece is a book-like chair inspired by journaling. Whenever I felt like feelings were cramped inside of me, I've often found journaling as one of the ways to release them. A viewer can flip through the pages with various textures and change, change the angle of the book to find the perfect fit for their body. I choose to keep the pages empty to allow the viewers to imagine endless possibilities of what could fill the empty pages in their mind. The second work from the Comfort Sun series is a swing stool. This, this piece was inspired by the cue poles we often see at the airport or at the theme park to keep us in line. When I was younger, I found it interesting how limiting the object itself was. It limited us from moving elsewhere and we could not touch the pole anyway. I wanted to break the limitation of the object and turn it into something welcoming and interactive. With this piece, viewers can choose their seats to attach them to the poles. This sculptural painting is where my current vision is focused on the value of time. In the past, I faced a few near-death moments from almost losing my mom to nearly losing myself. And from those and other experiences, I had a big fear of death. From having no freedom to all, 
I often found value in the moments others might not care about. I wanted to create a piece dedicated to those moments and talk about how the beauty of life is not something big, but it's a collection of every moment we, we get to have while we are here. This curved painting exposes the back of the canvas, hiding the actual painting from the public. Viewers can only look at the painting once they locate themselves inside it. The gap between the end of the canvas creates a portal to the interior and the exterior of the piece. My intention is to convey how we should cherish the moments that we think are not worth remembering. After I graduate, I plan to explore more of this world as an artist and as, as an individual and create more art wherever I am. Thank you so much for coming to my conversation. Thank you, Kelsey. Good job. Um, you still have two minutes and 44 seconds to go, but that's okay. Let's move right, right into discussion. So um, I don't know, is there a way, Narjis, to just have Prabha and Kelsey big? Can we pin two people? Yes, you, uh, you should um, change the view on top of your Zoom right uh -huh. to speaker. Okay. From gallery to speaker. Ah, uh, got it. And it'll and it'll sort of oscillate back and forth between them. Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, take it away, Prabha. All right. Well, congratulations. This um, Prabha, I see. you yeah. are not coming through clearly. Or is that my connection? No, we can't hear her. We couldn't hear her. Okay. Still not working. Oh, no. And it was working when we did the test. <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah. You sound like you're in a sandstorm or something. Oh, wait. It just worked a minute ago. So oh, you're better. You are better now. You are. Hey, well, now I better. Yes. Went into audio settings and <laughs> changed them. Um, Fantastic. All right. So I'm glad you can hear me, Kelsey. Congratulations uh, on all this work. Uh, thank you for explaining kind of the how your work is rooted in your experience uh, and the kind of factors that kind of went into shaping you at such a young age when you changed uh, countries. Um, such a difficult thing to do when you're young. And I, you know, really could see the, uh, across all these different mediums that you're working in, there's a real sensitivity and uh, you can see you know, this kind of, there's mo emotion, there's feelings, there's inclusion, like the journal chair, um, how someone can enter your world. Um, also with the untitled piece, how someone can enter your world. You know, I was wondering, uh, when you select the medium, what determines what medium you're going to work in? Um, I usually start out with wood because that's the material I'm most familiar with. But I also believe that wood has a lot of flexibilities and it's it's a living material. So I find it very interesting to work with wood. And I add um, different media as I continue to um, add more ideas into it. And uh, have you, I saw that you did the True Hero performance. And I have a few questions about that. Is that the first performance you did? Uh, yes. And uh, what was your experience uh, like 
while you were, uh, as far as what I understood, you were dragging this heart-shaped coffin through the woods. I'm not clear if you were by yourself or if you were with somebody, but what, how long did that piece go on and how did it feel to be doing that? Um, I was with a group of um, students with Mia Fear, Professor Mia Fear. Um, we went on a trip to install our work in the nature and the piece was about five minute long. Um, and I, during that time, I, I, I was in a moment where I felt very stuck as an artist and um, Professor Mia really helped me um, kind of break break through those tough moments. And that's how I was able to come up with that performance piece. So I felt very relieved afterwards. Fascinating. That's really uh, fantastic. And I would love to see more images of that uh, piece and uh, also more images of other pieces. So I could have, for instance, more of a sense of them in the round um, and, you know, different viewings of them, perhaps even with the chair, like someone sitting on it. But uh, just even seeing that image, um, it's really poignant and to, it says a lot. Uh, it's when you are making a coffin of a heart, uh, you're kind of immediately, by doing that, you raised all of these questions, where does the heart go? Um, how do we grieve? Um, what do we do when our heart has been broken? Um, and how also can we transcend those uh, those situations? Oh, this was in the snow. I'm seeing someone writing in the comments. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, it's something that is really visible throughout your work is a real attending to uh, like the subtleties. And for instance, in the photograph with the balloon that's burst, um, we have the notion of the flowers and I'm not sure the sim symbols of uh, those flowers in Marguerite, but uh, you have that and then you have this broken balloon. Um, and there's a lot of sensitivity and a lot of different readings that can go into that work. Could you speak about that piece a little more? Um, Marguerite? Yes. So I was, um, the idea came onto my mind when I was um, walking across the street as I realized that in order for me to truly grow out from myself and heal from my past, I need to accept the feelings I feel and express the emotions I have. Um, and I almost felt like those emotions that are expressed are um, kind of almost like watering the flowers. So I wanted to visualize that um, and how ripped apart balloons might seem might visually seem ugly but at the end it gives you a little water to your plant that's on your mind great uh, I can see that coming across and the choices that you made in that piece um, with the formal arrangement and then this blue uh, abstract shape ultimately that uh, is uh, in the other higher part of that um, and you know, with this passion that you have for art and uh, where would you like to see your practice go now that you're going to be done with um, with your undergraduate education? Um, I don't have a set up path that I'm planning to go through, but I, I don't want to push myself and rush myself um, just because out of fear of uh, money or time, but rather I want to continue to explore as an artist um, because I'm still, even after I graduate, I know I'm very young um, in my life. So I want to explore as much as I can and 
gain more experiences, um, interacting with the community and others. Um, but that's my plan for now. Great. Uh, I think that's a great approach. And especially when looking at uh, one of your favorite artists, uh, Nam June Paik, and uh, the incredible amount of work this person made over their life and uh, their approach to working in different mediums, uh, which you sh showed in the work, um, photographs, performance, sculpture, uh, three-dimensional work, um, experimental, you know, uh, trying, you know, different kinds of um, objects like the swing stool or um, where you're really thinking about comfort and how to provide comfort and comfort for whom. And so going back to uh, the artists that you're inspired by, who work in different mediums, especially Nam June Paik, and really seem to have a theme that was elaborated in deeper and deeper iterations. And um, I can see how with this passion that you have, it seems to me that a lot of your work also is about healing. And uh, as you're going through your journey of healing and of uh, create creatively uh, working and uh, making your pieces, um, you know, it, continuing to experiment, continuing to uh, make objects that resonate for you and resonate for others, continuing to experiment with taking those objects out of the studio and into the world. Uh, I am a sculptor that became a performance artist, but, uh, and, you know, I'm in my studio right now, um, but it's all final, started- Final 30 seconds. With sculpture, sculpture. And so I really encourage you to keep going and keep experimenting and keep making work and keep uh, sharing this passion with the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kelsey, congratulations. Prabha, thank you. Kelsey, I want to say I was there for that performance in the woods with that giant, heavy, wooden, heart, coffin sculpture. And it was one of the most powerful performances I have seen a student do since I've started working at CCA. You were out there pushing that thing around in the snow, barefoot. It was extremely heavy. You wrestled that thing. It was brutal and powerful and emotional. And um, I, I know there's a video of it somewhere and I hope you, I don't know. I'm not sure where that leads, but I just like, yeah, it was, it was a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up we have, Ajaya Bhatnagar. Hello. Hello. All right. Um, so same thing as Kelsey. I'm going to start the clock in a second and um, then probably will respond. Okay? Yeah. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see it? Uh, yes. Go for it. All right, I'll start. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Ajaya, and I'm an individualized major, and I have a double minor in ecological practices and history of art and visual culture. So I'll start by talking a little bit about myself. I was born and brought up in New Delhi, India, and I've spent 18 years of my life there until I moved to San Francisco in January of 2021 to do my bachelor's in fine arts. And I've been drawing since I can remember. I remember my mom enrolling me and my sister in drawing classes when we were very little. And then I just continued drawing when I was in school. And by the time I was in high school, that's when I was pretty sure in my mind, at least, that I wanted to continue my career as an artist. I'll talk a little bit about my inspirations. 
So I get a lot of inspiration for my work from different locations and memories, both here in San Francisco, but also in India. I like to look at specific places and times that were very memorable for me, very important for me, like the picture of the bonfire. I took this picture a few years back. This was a very common practice that we had in India, where during winters, my family and I would gather together at nights, build a fire, have dinner around it, talk and have a really good time. And then the two pictures on the bottom left, the Chrissy Field Beach and the Mission Creek Park, they're both here in San Francisco. And these are two places that are very important for me as well, because these are the places where I would go hang out with my friends when the I was here in 2021. The campus was closed cafe was closed. We weren't allowed to go into each other's dorm rooms. So this was the only place where I made connections, the very first connections that I had once I came to this new country for the first time. So two artists I've been looking at are right now are Pei White and Anika Yi. I love both of their work. Anika, uh, Pei White's work, it's just, I love the kind of patterns and designs she makes, especially with the objects, like just lying around mundane objects that you could find day in your day-to-day -day life. And then she, just the way she uses them to make impressions and prints and designs is very inspiring for me. I like Annika Yi's work because she tries to involve multiple senses, like her work has visual effects. It also has different smells, touch, sound. And that is something I like to do in my work as well, whenever I get a chance. And just her work has been a really good inspiration for me to look at. So a little bit about my work. This is one of the first pieces I did when I came to San Francisco in my first semester here at CCA. Um, I like to make my pieces interactive. And this was the first experiment I ever did with interactive work where I made this sculpture and it has little aluminum cans with soil and I planted some plants that I was growing in my room at that time. And as a part of the piece, I encouraged people to take a piece or a clipping of the plant with them and grow it at their homes or whatever they would like. After that, I did this series over a year called At Grandma's House. It's based on three pictures that I found in my archive when I was looking for inspiration to work. And um, these three pieces are, yeah, like I said, based on three pictures that I clicked. The eucalyptus is from a walk I had with my grandma many years ago. The one in the middle is an early morning drive where we saw the sunrise. And the bonfire piece is based on the picture I shared earlier as a part of the inspirations. And it's just the pixelation is sort of like a commentary on how we depend on technology for our own experiences and memories so much that had I not gone back that one day, looked at the archive, I might have forgotten about these beautiful experiences. But just to avoid that, I decided to paint them. So now I, every time I look at these pieces, I can just relive those memories and experiences. This is another piece I did based on the night sky that I watched growing up at my grandparents' house. When I was in Delhi, where I was born, growing up there, it's a very polluted city, so we couldn't see much of stars. But when I would go to my grandparents' house, it would just be a completely different experience. And so I took a piece of cardboard and punched holes into it at different angles to make or replicate the constellations and planets I would see or my parents would point out to me when we would be at my grandparents' house. And the the holes that I punched into the cardboard are at different angles. So if you walk in front of the piece, it looks like the board is twinkling. I installed the piece in a little cubicle that I found on campus with a glass window behind it. So the piece is backlit using the natural light coming from behind. And I installed a little speaker in the cubicle as well that played the recordings of the nighttime sounds that I gathered from my grandparents' house over months and years. So for my thesis work that I'm focusing on this semester, the idea for this started with these two pieces that I made about two years ago. The two pieces are based on the two pictures of the locations I shared in my inspirations, the Chrissy Field Beach and Mission Creek Park, 
both of these places are very important for me because this is where I would hang out and this is where I felt like I belonged here a little bit or like the first friends I made was in these places. And the process behind these was just, I would go to those places again and again. As I would walk around, I would just pick up materials that I would find, bring them back home or bring them here to my studio and turn them into artworks. So just the whole process of doing this, going to those places, collecting materials was so rewarding for me. And the kind of response that I got from people when they saw this work was also so positive that I decided to expand on it this semester for my thesis show. And it led to many more pieces that I've been working on. And these are two of them. I just finished them, I think a week or two ago. And the one on the left is a henna piece. I love doing henna. It's a practice that has been in my family. It's a part of my culture. And um, when I'm here, I miss it a lot because I don't, I, it feels like I sort of lose that connection and that sense of belonging and community. And I miss not being able to celebrate the family events and celebrations and festivals the way I used to be able to when I was in India. So I decided to make a piece about it. And the piece on the right is a mandala art design that I made and then I embroidered it and mounted it on wood. I started doing embroidery last summer when during summer, the last summer during the summer break when I was struggling a lot with some physical health issues, mental health, stress, homesickness, and I couldn't go back home. So I started to teach myself embroidery to keep myself occupied, to keep my mind distracted. But that time also reminded me of a similar experience I had in my first semester in January of 2021, when I was dealing with similar stress, homesickness, cultural shock, and a lot more things at that time. And mandala art was something I started back then to help me cope with stress and to meditate and keep my mind off of all the problems that were going on in my life at that time. So I decided to combine the two mandala art and embroidery, two different things that helped me get through similar experiences into one piece. Um, these are two pieces that I'm currently working on. These also deal with similar topics like my different practices I've picked up for coping with stress, physical illness, mental health, and everything else. The piece on the left is about different plants I have in my room. I love plants. I have around 40, 45 plants in my room. So the process of this was I collected leaves and I rolled them into clay, fired the clay to make these little sculptures that I'm combining. And the piece on the right is sort of like a collage of different practices I picked up, like embroidery, punch needle, mandala art, paper mosaic. The clay tiles have impressions of different medications and old paint brushes I used. But yeah, so my entire body of work will be on display from April 24th to 26th at the CCA Campus Gallery. And I hope everybody can make it, not just for me, but for all the other artists. We've all put in a lot of work this semester and for the past four years into making our work and putting it out there. And yeah, thank you so much. And I would just like to like thank my professors and all their guidance and my partner who's here today. And he's just been such a great support system through all the tough times I've had. And more like the biggest thank you to my family who's not here today, but hopefully they'll be watching this later sometime because it's crazy late in India right now. But like, thank you so much for all the sacrifices they've made to help me get here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajaya. All right, um, Prabha. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, sharing not only your work, but uh, your stories about your family and about what's so, so deeply meaningful to you. I really see Ajaya. Prabha, yeah. Prabha, your audio is still very, like, unclear. I'm not sure what you did to change. You changed a I it, it, it went um, wrong and I have it 
Uh, is this any better? No. How weird. It was working. That is better. I'm not actually doing anything, but it's better. It just got better. I don't know. Maybe we just roll with it. Okay. Okay. Is this, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, I just want to uh, share how uh, I really saw an amazing, amazing commitment to real materials, to real materiality, to um, really going and and working with these different elements, um, whether it be soil and aluminum and plants or embroidery and textiles or sand or um, across all of these different works, there just seemed a, like a real commitment to going deeply into uh, m the materiality that you're working with and making physical work with it. Um, super interesting work and uh, you're able to achieve very different effects. And I was really interested on, in your relationship uh, with materiality and how you work with different materials, particularly in response to and in ways that really help you move through challenging times and challenging moments. And it, what I saw in the work is how um, you're able to really reconnect uh, with really embracing your culture and embracing uh, your sense of belonging and embracing your sense of community. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your relation to the materials you work with. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, like you mentioned, the materials I pick, I sometimes struggle a lot to find the ones that I resonate with the most. But I think um, materials are just for now, something that um, I feel like I'm a little limited to because of just the resources I have, but I try to make the most of it. And um, I feel like I think materials are just, I'm sorry, I'm like totally blanking out right now. Could you repeat your question once more? Uh, I saw um, all of these uh, ways that you take a material, like you took cardboard, you made holes in it, and you were able to create a beautiful night sky that follows your own ecological principles and is backlit mm -hmm. by natural light. <laughs> so it's a great way to capture something from memory uh, when you were uh, at your grandparents and able to actually see the night sky, not in the city of uh, New Delhi, but uh, and transmit that through materials. And across your work, I see that you're able to take materials and communicate completely different things um, that really connect back to your culture, your memories, and your experiences. So it's very much in line with your inspirations. You were talking about uh, Annika Yi and uh, mm -hmm. the work with, um, you know, the senses, the touch, the sound, and the visual. And I see how you're able to create these textures, create these images, uh, you know, work with pixelation, you know, all of these ways that you're working with material that uh, bring the viewer in, uh, expose them to different kinds of uh, visual languages that you are creating with the materials you work with. And um, so I was just really, I'm kind of really excited about and I think uh, it's very successful how you work with materials and how you're able to work with all of these different materials 
and through all of that, really share uh, your the the world, your world of memories, your world of community, your world of belonging, and you know your real culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I think it was just the original idea, like the first two pieces I made from the beach and the park, the way I approached those pieces were just finding materials and turning them into pieces. But then over time, a lot of my professors were like, this work is great, but you have an entire life back in India that could also be represented through materials. But I was like, I can't bring those materials here. So professors like David Huffman and Mia, they both like really pushed me to think outside the box and be like, well, just because you don't have the material here doesn't mean you still can't share those stories. So I just went crazy trying and testing different materials. Some worked, some didn't. A lot of these pieces, like there's other pieces underneath them layered because I was trying a different material, but it just didn't work for that piece. So I would just scrape it all off and start something new on top. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think those layers and that layering and those attempts and those experiments and trying to work with, uh, with new materials and trying to invoke kind of a memory landscape that way and, and being very experimental with it, uh, provides so much resonance it's like as you're layering the, all of it's there all of it is there and it just creates a lot of resonance in the viewer um and you know it just creates this whole world that the viewer can join you in and uh it's a real invitation one of the things that you talked about was being interested in interactivity and uh, how you were experimenting with that in the trash can piece. And I'm wondering if you want to expand that part of your practice in the future or uh, what your thoughts are about that. I think I definitely do want to expand the interactive part. I love just the thought of people being able to take a piece of my work with them, just like specifically that kind of interactive relationship like it's something I made something I nurtured over time I put in a lot of effort into it and I just love that somebody else can have a piece of it and have their own interpretation to it and yeah I think that's definitely something I want to do in the future and it's I'm still working on one of the pieces for my thesis in which I'm thinking of writing a lot of poetry based on different parts of my different times in the past four years and then having multiple copies of it that people can take with them. Something like that I can give from my art more than just visually. I think it would uh, be a really wonderful um, exploration to continue. I'm really excited to hear that you're working on that right now uh, and continuing uh, to both create these sculptural pieces and these paintings uh, in the, you know, experimenting with new materials, but also adding elements of uh, your world that people can take with them. I, I think that's a wonderful direction to go in and to continue exploring. Thank you. Um, we're sort of out of time. Okay. For that conversation. Thank you so much, Ajaya. Thank you so much, Prava. Um, Ajaya, ah, great work. You spoke really, really well. Um, Thank you. So next up, uh, we have Tamara Yasmin Sobek. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Go for it. So, hi, my name is Tamara. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an individualized studies major. 
I'm primarily a weaver and a screen printer, and some of the themes that I work with are repetition, reiteration, and pattern, the domestic environment, vulnerability, intimacy, abject, demolition as a symbol, um, my relationships, both romantic and with my family, um, generational and personal trauma and healing, and just utilitarian cloth and its history and significance to me. So when I came to CCA in 2019, this was the kind of work that I was enjoying doing the most. Um, but then I had to take a leave of absence in 2020, which ended up being great because the pandemic hit and I got to be at home for that in Buenos Aires. Um, and yeah, the pandemic in Argentina was, the, the quarantine was pretty strict and I really needed to find an outlet or something new to learn to cope with it. And that's how my relationship with textiles began. Um, I taught myself how to embroider and I started making iterations from drawing from my illustrations and translating them into threads. And I enjoyed it so much. And it was such a beautiful coping mechanism for me. I embroidered from the morning to the night every day. And it's just, I think, the best thing that I got out of the pandemic. Um, so when I came back to CCA in 2021, I um, started taking textiles classes, which I didn't even know was a possibility for me before the pandemic. Um, and this is one of the first um, weavings that I made. It's woven on the TC2, which is a kind of jacquard um, loom. And this piece also includes the chess pieces that I used to learn how to play chess. Um, they used to belong to my grandfather. So when I was starting to work on this piece, um, I was kind of in the aftermath of processing my first relationship and breakup. So for this piece, I was thinking about just the concept of butterfl butterflies in my stomach as thinking about love, but at the same time, just nausea and anxiety and the panic attacks that I um, was navigating in my relationship. Um, so in the same vein of work, I made this other piece, um, that is talking about similar themes, but it's also including a real actual cake and the performance that went with it and, um, in which I would eat the cake with my own hands. And for me, it was a signifier of just, um, the liberation from my relationship, but also the anxiety that I was going through as I was able to eat again more normally after I broke up. This is a close up from the woven text in the piece that's in Spanish. So around that time, I got to know more of my, uh, one of my biggest inspirations, that's Alberto Greco. He's an Argentinian artist from the sixties that started as an informalist painter that would use um, just abject and intimacy and vulnerability in his work a lot, and then moved to more performative and happenings kind of work. Um, this is a performance that he did where he promoted himself a little bit ironically by putting his name all around the city. Um, and I was inspired by that because I have a little bit of a complicated relationship with social media. Um, well, not complicated. I just, I don't love it. I'm not great at it. <laughs> so I was trying to think about different ways of showing my work. So I, I did something similar and I put my work around Buenos Aires and it was a super enjoyable experience. And that got me thinking about other ways of sharing my work other than digitally. So I encountered the zine format, uh, which was wonderful for me. I um, started screen printing my own zines. This was the first one I made, uh, talking about the same theme and um, kind of work. And the the zine format really allowed me to show more of my process and details and also to write a little bit about my work. So I really enjoyed it. Um, this is another zine that I made that is absolutely different, but still super enjoyable uh, to make for me, um, which is just a zine about my cat and my morning routine with my cat and my night routine with my cat. I, it was, I had just adopted him and I was obsessed with him as you can tell. Um, and yeah, this was drawing from, stylistically was drawing from my first few 
uh, screen prints that I made in 2022. Um, with this aesthetic, I was trying to um, glorify the idea of mundane day-to-day -day just activities, domestic things. Um, like making coffee in the morning and those kinds of things that I feel like are so grounding and beautiful and have so much value in our lives. And yeah, I would love to keep exploring this style um, and subjects um, after I graduate. So an event that really impacted my art practice was the demolition of my house in 22 as well. Um, it was really abrupt for me. Well, it was really abrupt in general. <laughs> Um, we weren't really expecting it. And um, I just faced a lot of mixed fe mixed feelings from it because I really loved the house itself. And, you know, I spent all of my life there, but at the same time, I, I was carrying some not so positive memories um, from things that happened in the house. So for me, it meant like closure, but at the same time, a loss. Um, so I made work about it. And yeah, this piece was um, the materials I was using. It, it's hemp and it's hand woven on the floor loom. And the tent is being held by weaving stools and some personal objects that remind me of my home and a functioning lamp. That's my only light source in my home <laughs> and a non-functioning lamp on the other side. Um, so for the weaving structure, I chose one of the most stable structures that is plain weave. I wove it in um, double cloth. But um, as I was weaving, I started cutting through um, some of the warps and the th uh, threads in the warp, um, making the structure more unstable and giving it this kind of raggedy look. And it was a very cathartic experience. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, these are some close-ups from the stools and the inside of the tent. This piece came from the same threads um, and it was just, um, I. it's basically, it's my floor plan from that home and I'm exploring the ideas of memory as evidence for myself. Um, and yeah, and then this piece is the piece that um, inspired the work that I'm doing right now for my thesis. Um, this sex archive was actually born out of shame. <laughs> I stained something during sex and I felt so filled with shame that I told myself that I would need to get an ugly old rag and to never feel the shame again um, and use that during sex. And then my second thought was, no, <laughs> I want to have sex in something beautiful and soft and precious. So I made a weaving for it and I transformed these, just this shameful nature of sex stains into a precious archive for myself. Um, so yeah, that's one of the pieces that's gonna be in my show and I'm, the rest is kind of in progress. <laughs> um, so for my thesis show, I'm thinking about the ideas of just um, my complicated relationship with emotional and physical intimacy and how that intersects with um, just where I come from and my family and generational trauma. Um, and yeah, and for this these um, installation, I'm using traditional weaving techniques from coverlets and traditional coverlet like inspirations and as well as um, basketry for the headboard and the frame of the bed. Um, and although I'm, I'm referencing a more traditional um, approach, at the same time, I'm making them not fully functional. Like the, the reeds uh, for the basket weaving are a little bit unstable and the coverlet, you can't really wrap yourself around it because it has a huge hole. Um, so those are sort of some of the ideas that I'm navigating with it. Um, and it's all hand dyed with natural dyes. It's all uh, indigo, logwood, and matter root. Uh, so yeah, my show is called The Stains in My Grandmother's Nightgown and it will open on April 24th. So yeah, thank you everyone that took the time to be here and everyone that has supported me through my journey for me to be here today.
Thank you so much, Tamara. That was incredible. Your work is so powerful. Prabha, I'm sure you have lots to say. Take it away, honey. Prabha, Prabha, that audio is not coming through. Maybe leave and come back? Um, how about now? Yes. I for some reason the mic doesn't doesn't work. But if you can hear me now, uh, I will go on. Um, I mean, it's not great, but it's better than it was ten seconds ago. Okay. Um, that's so strange. Um, all right. So I uh really want to congratulate you on this work and on this. Uh, move uh, into textiles and weaving and um, dyeing and creating and all of this uh, creative uh, exploration. Um, it's such an interesting trajectory to have gone back to Buenos Aires uh, because of the pandemic. And I, from what I understood, you taught yourself how to embroider. <laughs> And it, it that's amazing. I don't know if your family, if anybody embroidered in your family that was sh sharing this with you. Um, no, I think um, in 2019, I had a professor that showed us the basics, like, but I was, I, I tried once and I had no, like, I was so terrible at it that I told myself, people make so beautiful things I should learn. <laughs> I should teach myself. And that's how it happened. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's such an, uh, like an incredible area of development uh, for your work. And it just opened up all these possibilities for you. What I really saw across all these different pieces is how you really share, I mean, you called it glorifying the mundane. And, you know, la vida, la vida cotidiana, la vida cotidiana. So, the mundane is the real actual stuff of actual life. Um, you know, it's not the big abstractions. It's the very real uh, day to day that we uh, go through uh, living uh, on this planet together and how you're able to take these experiences, uh, you know, in the, the, the mi casa que ya no está, for instance, that piece, and the sex archive and all of these um like paso de mariposas abomito these are the parts of the mundane that many 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 of us share and these kind of experiences are shared and how you're able to capture that and um be super creative in uh, making these pieces and uh you know, putting it out there for the public to reflect on and to resonate with is really, really successful. It's really working. And then to be able to build, uh, you know, this piece that you wove uh, everything together, um, how in uh, and the way that you made those forms and collected that stuff, I think it really resonates uh, for many of us whose casa que ya no está, right? Whether it's a physical house or a, a cultural house or a community that we were in or a country we're in or all of these things, que ya no está, right? That is no longer. And um, it's really exciting to see these um the you know the colors the shapes the forms the techniques that you're bringing forward and introducing and uh, building in your work and you know adding all of this conceptual elements to it it's really fascinating um to take something that's inspired by shame and transform it um 
And I was wondering, while you're doing these pieces uh, and sharing these pieces, uh, what, for you, what are the directions that you really see that uh, you want to continue exploring? Um, first, I wanted to thank you for your response. That's that's really wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. Um, well, the direction I I'm really I'm really excited about my senior show. I'm I'm still working on it, so I I want to see what happens with it. But I'm starting to become very interested in the format of the bed. Like I'm th I'm thinking about what multiple different beds of different times of my life could be like and just I, I'm, I'm super curious about just the object of the bed and it's something that I'm just starting to get in and that I still need time to reflect on but I mean definitely I'm gonna keep weaving <laughs> um and yeah I I want to mention there's been a lot of performances done with beds in the street <laughs> And because it's such a resonant uh, and cotidiana is so mundane, the bed is just such a mundane part of life, but also a loaded part of life. And there's been a lot of performances, even including in Buenos Aires, done with beds. And I saw that, you know, in uh, Tan Tan Hermosa, where you had the real cake, you did a performance. And I'm wondering, if in that performance you were eating the cake and if you also want to explore performing amidst your weavings or your textiles or your works. Yeah, I I would really love that. It's something that I think about that I haven't done in a while, but I'm definitely thinking about for the future. Yeah, performance is a great medium. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I encourage you to look at some of the, the uh, work that's been done with beds. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, in public places and, um, you know, see uh, where exactly you want to continue, you know, develop that um, within that framework and uh, to continue uh, sharing these very vulnerable uh, moments with the public in your own ways as you're doing. And, um, like to continue developing, you know, both your storytelling that's embedded in these pieces and the ways that you are embedding it um, and uh, experimenting with zines also, how uh, you're able to share your work if you're really turned off by social media, uh, to be able to share your work with the public, there's still so many formats as you did by uh, hanging pieces in Buenos Aires or sharing zines. Yeah. I I'm wondering if you're gonna continue that too. Oh, 100%, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, my plans after graduation are basically going home to Buenos Aires again. And one of the first things I wanna do is find a place to screen print again, because <laughs> I really need to have access to that. Again, yeah, it's really important for me. Okay, wonderful. Um, and I, Mia, I'm wondering how much time we have left. Uh, there's another two minutes. If um, Tamara, you have any questions for Praba? Um, well, I I know that you're an international artist as well. Um, do you have any tips to someone that's just starting out or post graduation tips? Uh. I mean, I'm someone that, uh, I'm Colombian and i am lived in 10 countries as an adult by now. Um, and my main advice is to connect wherever you are with fellow, with other artists that are as excited as you are about the mediums you're working with. And for instance, if I was going to Buenos Aires, in your case, I would connect with printing collectives, with mm -hmm. zine collectives, with zine and people that are really into those things with also with weavers and uh, installation artists, performance artists. There's so much uh, uh, that's happening in Buenos Aires uh, in all of these arenas. It's such a huge city. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and it has so many different kinds of art and kinds of artists and contributions. And so I always recommend connecting with other artists that are working in the forms that you're working in and uh, sharing work as often as you can. Thank you, that's great advice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Prabha. Thank you, Tamara, Mazel Tov, congratulations, wonderful work. Um, let's see, who is next? Daniela Cruz Perez, are you ready to go? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I guess let's just keep rolling. Uh, I will set the clock and um, share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Daniela Cruz and I'm currently doing a double major in writing and individualized studies. Um, but before talking about my artistic practice, I consider it important to talk a little bit more about my background. So, um, sorry, it's not going to the next slide. Oh, right there. Um, so I was born and raised in Mexico. And since I was a child, I was always encouraged to honor and be proud of my roots. Uh, this is a photograph of my neighborhood back in Mexico, in the state of Michoacán. And as you will see later, um, many of the colors and symbols um, that you see in the picture are also present in my work. Another source of inspiration for me has been the book, The Labyrinth of Solitude, written by the Mexican poet Octavio Paz, which describes various aspects of Mexican psychology and how it expresses itself um, through different masks when facing the outside world. So one of the phrases uh, from the book that I consider represents the nature of my artistic practice is the following. The Mexican can bend, can bow humbly, can even stoop, but he cannot back down. That is, he cannot allow the outside world to penetrate his privacy. And it is the same hermeticism of the Mexican identity that I explore in many of my works. Uh, so thinking about the existentialist labyrinth that the book describes, I decided to name my senior show um, The Labyrinth of Identity. And this is one of the main pieces in the gallery and one of the first that I made, The Labyrinth of Livery. And this is a representation of my experience as a Mexican immigrant to the United States. On the left side, um, there is the image of Octavio Paz. And on the right side, there is the image of Tintan, a symbol of the Pachuco, a countercultural movement of the Chicano community. Uh, the entrance to the labyrinth holds the phrase to the children of Malinche, the Aztec woman who served as translator to the conquistador Cortes. And in the background, you can see the image of the Statue of Liberty, uh, also a symbol of the American dream. Uh, this second piece is based on the painting The Danites, made by John Waterhouse. And according to the Greek myth of the painting, the Danites were condemned to serve water in a container with holes for all eternity. In this case, each woman represents the states of the Mexican Republic that have the highest rates of femicides. Um, so just like the Danites, Mexican women are forced to empty blood in this container, which is a metaphor for the circle of violence uh, that they are live and for which justice never comes. This acrylic paint is also our interpretation of the work Stonebreakers by Courbet. And just like Courbet, I decided to create a realistic work that showed the efforts of the working class. Uh, but in this case, um, is in focus on the migrant community in the great fields of the US. And as I had mentioned before, I'm also doing a major in literature. So some of my writings have also been the motivation for my work in the Individualized Stories program. One of them is A Prayer to Tesplatipoca, a short story about the encounter between the Aztec Empress Atotostli and the god of the night, Tezcatlipoca. 
And has she has she asked him for help to save her people from the Spanish conquest? So this is a small piece uh, of the dialogue from the story uh, where uh, she says, that's right, Lord, my knowledge is vast and deep. I know that as generations past, our people will perish under the command of men of steel. I know that fire and disease will consume us. I know that our faces will change and we will no longer be able to recognize ourselves in our reflections. They will make us replace our beliefs and you, O oh master of duality, will be nothing more than smoke in a mirror. Um, so from that story, I made this, um, I made this uh, sketching graphite of one of its scenes and from which I later made a painting in watercolors. So I was exploring the same idea for some graphite then on watercolors. And finally, I also explored uh, the same scene on digital media. Um, at this time, I began to further explore the possibilities of digital art in Photoshop. And I created also this uh, self-portrait uh, where I tried to illustrate both my role as an artist and as a writer. So my digital, my digital works also have a more commercial focus uh, without leaving aside the symbology of Mexican culture. This, for example, is the design for the poster of a Mexican rock band for which I intended to make a female representation of the god uh, Quetzalcoatl and the Tree of Life. Uh, this is the design for the cover of the book that I just talked about previously and that has inspired my work all this time. And this is the way the book will look on a shelf, in a bookstore or a library. Uh, currently, for my thesis in the illustration program, I'm working on the design of 10 labels of Mexican drinks. Each label is in turn based on a legend that explains the origin of such beverages. For example, this is the label of pulque, and according to the legend, the brightness of the moon comes from the pulque inside it. So the rabbit protects the pulque, uh, while the tlacuache, a uh, type of rat, tries to steal it and sometimes succeeds. So according to the legend, that's why the moon has different phases for each time or for each, for each occasion in which the tlacuache has been able to steal the pulque from the moon. So that this is how the, the label will look on a bottle. Um, this is the how it will look. And also on the back side, there is the label that explains um, the, the legend and also has some words um, to promote the product. Uh, and I already had my senior show. I uh, hope some of you uh, have a chance, chance, chance to see it. And it was a very enriching experience and from which I learned a lot. Um, so beyond CCA, I would like to continue creating works that are related to the narrative of my Mexican culture. I would also like to invest more time in my writing. And thanks to my media history class, I have begun to learn more about magical realism, a movement in which both writers and artists of Latin America origin stand out. So I hope to learn more about the movement and continue growing as an artist. So before finishing, I would like to thank my professors in the Individualized Studies Department, Taro Hattori, Cristina Lasala, Tarane, and Amy for their support. And also like to thank Professor Prada Pilar for supporting my writing and academic growth. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, I didn't realize that you and Prabha already knew each other. So I'm really looking forward to Prabha's response. Thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, let me try this again. Um, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's, oh. not, it's not clear, but we can hear you. I'm really sorry about that. Um, uh, I really want to add ¿Qué está pasando con esta computadora? 
<risa> pero qué pena, qué pena, pero bueno, ahí, ahí, ahí voy a intentar. Uh, no se preocupe. <risa> uh, I, I, um, I really appreciate seeing uh, after the work that I had seen before, uh, how much you've grown and how your um, images are developing um, in graphite, in watercolors, in acrylics, and in digital media. It's uh, quite quite an incredible series of works and shows quite a bit of development in all those areas. And it's really amazing to see how deeply culturally informed your work is and uh, the kinds of commitments uh, you've made to both learning and sharing uh, these um, very meaningful cultural motifs uh, that are from the region that you're from. Um, and, you know, learning about them, making the work, and then sharing the work uh, with the broader general public. I am wondering, having seen your writing uh, and just getting a glimpse of that uh, with the prayer uh, that you shared a little bit of, um, I'm wondering how your, uh, how do you see the relationship between your visual work and your writing? Um, yeah, uh, for the, the relationship between uh, those two, I feel like usually my writing is something that inspires where I'm going to work on, uh, on my paintings. Also, the things that I that I've read are a source of inspiration for my paintings and my artworks. And I've seen that connection to in some uh, artists, like right now I'm doing a study on Leonora Carrington um, uh, tarot cards. And I also read some of um, her short stories. So I, I, I feel like that connection of those artists between what they're writing and what they're, um, what they're creating, it's something that inspires me a lot and something that I find very interesting and that I am uh, also find that connection in my work, like how uh, I'm do doing like this connection between uh, creating or painting something that is based on what I just described on my writing. I uh, have um, a number of books myself, uh, including by Laura Esquivel and many others that combine um, the text and the image. Um, and I saw that you really combined them um, um, in the pieces where you made the labels based on Mexican legends, where you did the image and then you wrote on the back of it. And I, I really uh, want to encourage you in finding these uh, ways to combine both your, um, your visual work and your textual work and you know, the labirinto, labirinto, like the way that you're created this painting, you know, the um, the labyrinth uh, that you created and the kinds of symbols that you put into it, um, it's just like really profound to be able to take works that are so well known uh, in across Latin America, um, and kind of put your own touch on it. It's uh, profound to put that painting, um, Un Sepulcro, eh, that where, you know, you put your own touch on it. That's really looking at something very contemporary that's happening right now with the femicides and how you uh, put your interpretation on it. And, um, being able to, to put contemporary moments or particularly your uh, contemporary interpretations onto these uh, very well-known pieces, no? Um, and doing that successfully and sharing through these forms uh, your ideas and your concepts, really sharing what you think is important for us to be looking at and also the great pickers and um, it's like sharing this landscape that you're inviting uh, the public to reconsider, to revisit, to experience alongside with you. Yeah. 
and that's coming across really well. And it's really interesting because I wasn't familiar with your visual work. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm not sure, um, I didn't see the senior show, but perhaps I'll be able to see it. Um, the kinds of um, visual works that you're making and the digital, uh, how you're working with color and form uh, in those digital pieces and uh, continuing that work. And I'm not really clear if you're working with uh, moving image at all, at all, or if not. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because also uh, a bit of my focus in the individualized studies program is on film because I wanted to take, uh, I find also that connection between narrative and, and visual um uh, visual art on, on, on films. So I, I did take some classes on, on, on film and also some script uh, writing classes um, because I also find that connection in that in that film. And it's something that I, I would like also to explore once I graduate. I would like to be uh, studying more about uh, cinema and about, yeah, uh, uh, and also animation I think will be something that I can combine to both of them, like the visual and the, and the writing. And um, yeah, I'm also invested on that and maybe uh, storyboard basically will be more my focus, the storyboard for animation and, and movies. There's an artist that I know, John J. Leaños. Uh, he began as a visual artist, began as a photographer and over time and has written pieces and was working as a visual artist, but over time moved into filmmaking and the moving image. And um, I think it'd be wonderful if you took a look at uh, John J. Leaños' work, and I can uh, send you the name directly, um, and how he moved into that, but also still creates visual art installations that are based in museums. Um, and so he does all of it, right? And I think yeah, you would be able to do uh, all of those things when, you know, as you uh, keep developing your practice um, after this BFA. Yeah, of course. Yeah, please. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm very excited to, to see more about uh, his work, to learn more about him. Yes. Um, and I'm going to uh, put that in right now. I say I'm just going to and, um, and you can easily find uh, their website and their work online. And um, yeah, it's really exciting also that uh, somebody that was sharing with you magical realism and the work of the Latin American boom uh, in literature and, you know, authors like Juan Rulfo and, uh, you know, a, a Gabriel Garcia Marquez and all of these incredibly rich uh, storytellers and experimental writers that uh, could be so inspiring to you for doing the kind of culturally informed work that you're doing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, for sure, it's something that I also want to to try and to do once I graduate. I would like to invest more time on, on my reading and learn more about Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Juan Rulfo, Ruben Dario, all mm -hmm. of them to, to feed more my work. Fantastic. Um, did you have any questions uh, about any recommendations or anything at all for me? Um, no really questions. I'm just very happy that you were able to be on my BFA conversation and thank you for all your advices. I'm very happy that we just traveled from Argentina to Mexico in this BFA conversation. <laughs> and and yeah, we, I'm very happy to see that Latin America is present uh, and that we are creating all this work. It's wonderful to see and it's really uh, beautiful to see your voice and your contribution using these forms in the way that you're doing it. I, I'm, uh, it's, it's really quite beautiful and I really can appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really powerful work. Um, thank you Prabha for your response. Next up we have Jay Morrison.
can can we see this? Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Jay Morrison. My pronouns are they, them. And I'm a individualized major. I mainly work in textiles, though. And so, okay, I didn't have it selected. So first up, in terms of inspiration and um, where sort of I get my motivation from, these are my, my animals. This is my dog, Rosie, and my cat, Chandler. And they basically keep me going. <laughs> They're my, they're my everything. And um, my dog keeps me, like allows me to go outside and uh, be out in nature and hike. That's her favorite thing. So it's become something I do as well. And then my cat is just full of personality. He's very anxious, but he's also very active. So both of them keep me very occupied. And I've um, related to animals. I've fostered animals my whole life. I've just been around animals my whole life. And uh, currently I foster guinea pigs. I haven't been able to do that though due to being in college, but that's, that's a love of mine. And then another love of mine is being out in the garden and being out in nature. And this is my garden I take care of where I grow flowers and natural dyes, such as zinnias, poppies, um, cosmos, and marigolds and yarrow. And then on the other side, we have agapantha, which is just all around my garden and pops up around July. And I've just, I grew up in Marin. And so I've just been around nature my entire life, right outside our door is open space. And that's just always been something that's been available to me. And then in terms of artists I look to, this is Alexandria Massey, who is a textiles artist who mainly crochets. She dyes her work using natural and synthetic dyes. And she, with these two pieces, works in particular, she blows up things that are in her garden to like a bigger scale. And yeah, the, the spider is made up of little like crochet doilies that are then pieced together to make a big giant spider. And Another inspiration of mine is Rachel Blodgett, who teaches here. I took her um, natural dye class about a year and a half ago, and she just sort of changed how I viewed, like, or uh, introduced me to dyeing as a process and connecting with plants and how the plants working with the cloth then sort of like resonates with the cloth and like the imagery on it also like stays with the cloth and just using plants to their fullest extent. And so on to early works that I did, this is a ceramic piece I did of a cake with a ridiculously big candle. The candle can come apart from the cake. They're two separate pieces. Um, I used to bake a lot. I don't as much anymore. I'm, I'm vegan now and I just, I, it's hard to transfer it, but I wanted to make a, use ceramics as a way as I would when baking and just sort of like bake and cook through ceramics and also make it kind of silly with a big giant candle. <laughs> and then I took a sculpture class where this was my first time crocheting and I was really obsessed with bubbles at the time, just the colors and shapes and like reflections of bubbles. And so I made a piece sort of like how like I would perceive bubbles and like through my lens what bubbles are through my lens and just focusing on the colors and the reflections and texture was another big one I wanted to make something that people would want to like squish <laughs> and then this is relating to my thesis work but this is my guinea pig Chewy his full name Chewbacca because he looks like Chewbacca he passed away in 2022 and my thesis work was a lot of mourning, but also celebrating him and then sort of becoming a little obsessed with guinea pigs and everything related to him. But this was the first piece I did, which is a like undying flowers relating to him to sort of like help me process and sort of help me get through what I was feeling at the time. And each flower had its own meaning for me, but also has their own flower. So some flowers for me were like looking towards the light and um, sort of trying to like focus on the good things. 
and then lavender for calmness. And then pink tulips mean love and blue tulips mean inner peace. And then the doily at the bottom is something that's been passed down in my family. So just making something that is intended to be used and like continue to live on. And then these are little sculpt ceramic sculptures I made of my animals so that they'll always be with me and I can always take them with me and sort of shrinking them down so that they can always be with me and making them all the same size when my dog, my cat, and my guinea pig are not the same size as each other. And just little things about them, like my tongue, my dog's tongue sticks out because she doesn't have any teeth. And my cat, that his arms out is his favorite sleeping position. So just little quirks they have that are then permanently in uh, ceramics. And then this is, it's right here in the background, but it's a woven piece I made out of cotton and the pattern is designed by me. They're little dandelion greens that then make up a bigger dandelion green, which dandelion greens are at least my guinea pig's favorite snack and a lot of guinea pig's favorite snack. And just the idea that it's seen as a weed, but it's so important to like me fostering guinea pigs. And it's just become like, I've become obsessed with the idea of a dandelion. And then it's the first layer it's dyed with is dandelion greens, and then it's synthetically dyed, and then it's dyed again with onion skins. And then this is a big guinea pig bean bag I made. And it's another thing of like blowing up something that's small and just making it big and making it so that people want to like go up to it and like touch it <laughs> and just see it as this cute thing but what's like painted on it is um things relating to guinea pigs and relating to my animals and also like things I care about like my roommate's names are on there and like my animals favorite foods are on there and just uh, making a big memorial of all the things I love and care about. And this is uh, naturally dyed with kutch and then iron painted on to make the kutch darker. And then this is a dandelion flower I made. I don't normally focus on the flower itself. I focus only on the leaves. So I, I thought that was funny. So I wanted to for once focus on the flower. So this is a floor piece that just grows up from the ground and it's all naturally dyed, some of which are marigolds that were grown in my garden. And yeah, I just I just wanted to focus on the flower rather than the leaf. And then this was like the main point of my thesis project. It's a my guinea pig space. It's it's pretty big, but it's um I want to focus the idea of taking little bits of something and making it into something bigger and like piecing together all those little pieces into becoming something else. And these are all synthetically dyed or the fabrics that have prints on them were thrifted and secondhand. And I wanted to focus on how fluffy he was because he was a very fluffy piggy and just bringing back florals and the garden and yeah and then this is a close-up of like the textures from it the other thing I've been trying to embrace is like little mistakes here and there and letting them shine rather than trying to erase them or forget about them but like embracing them and then plans for after college I plan to take like a, a little bit slower I feel like I've been just blasting through life and I just need a little break, a little time to like find myself and what I like to do and just breathe. And then I'd like to foster guinea pigs again because that's very much a love of mine. And I just got a loom. So I'm very excited to weave on that for the first time and continue exploring natural dyes and diving more into textiles. Like the moment I'm learning how to spin my own yarn. So a process I'm really interested in at the moment and then once I'm ready I plan to get my teaching credentials so I can teach elementary school art and do that with my life and then thank you and here's my animals again and that's my Instagram thank you thank you Jay that was great Prava go ahead okay 
Perhaps Jay or Mia, can you hear me at all? Yeah? Yes, now yeah. we can. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, it was wonderful to see the way that you, you know, both conceptually, uh, you know, have a, a really wonderful focus on really honoring, um, but not just honoring, celebrating uh, the relationships that you have with uh, your companion animals. And there's been a lot of kind of writing about um, the importance of our relationships with our companion animals that are with us and that we love and love us. And it's wonderful to see that across all the work, uh, you're really celebrating that. Um, something that's uh, so familiar to so many of us. Um, and you are in your work, you're really involved in all the parts of the process. So, you know, you're making the sculptures, you're making the shapes, you're making the forms, but you're also making the dyes, but you're also, it seems to me, you're growing the dyes uh, in your garden. And so, you know, it's a, a across all these different ways that you're um, taking on all the different parts of what it is that makes the sculptures that you make. Um, I, you know, was wondering, you know, in this celebrating with uh, your companions, uh, if you've ever directly collaborated with your animals on making art pieces. I have not, but they are oftentimes involved. Like my cat really likes me spinning yarn and he keeps whacking it. But <laughs> I I haven't considered collabing with them fully, but I would be interested in that. Have you ever tried or seen any uh, felt that is made from animal hair? I have, yeah. Yeah, I... I currently don't have access to a guinea pig, but <laughs> once I do, I'd be curious in spinning that and also working with that. I, I think it would make a, a really wonderful extension of, um, of your work to continue, um, continue this celebration and this journey and this recognition of, you know, celebrating you know, your beloved companions in these ways by kind of working with them even more and finding ways, for instance, to felt their hair and um, weave with it or include it in different ways. Yeah, I feel like sometimes it does work its way in just because animal hair is everywhere in my house and like my cat's hair is everywhere and my dog's hair is everywhere. So I think little bits of them are in a lot of the things I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, same same here. There's a lot of the hair everywhere. And uh, there's, you know, other elements in what you do with the, um, like the crochet piece and the bubbles and the shapes that you're working with and the kind of explorations of texture um, that are, you know, really quite beautiful um, and experimental and playing with uh, the way that you're going to handle this medium on um, the crochet piece that you did. And, you know, there's kind of, it's really kind of interesting how you're inviting people to come up to pieces. Like for me, the textile of the crochet piece, you talked about it being squishy. And I thought, oh, you really want people to come up and play with it. And with the bean bag, it's like, come and sit here and be here and enjoy this. Uh, and so it seems like you also want to collaborate with the public in uh, sharing these works. 
I I do with some of them. Yeah, like the the big bean bag. I wanted people to sort of look at it and go, I I need to touch that. I need to interact with it. And like when we had, I had it in my dorm. My roommates and I were literally using it as a bean bag. That, <laughs> and I. I like when things can have like multiple purposes or not just for the wall and such like the guinea pig face I made is going to be like a bed for my animals as well. So I I like when things have multiple, they're not just like artworks. They're also things I'm going to use. Um, have you ever considered recording any of your animals and including all the audio elements in any of these pieces? I have never considered audio. <laughs> But I do think it'd be fun to, because I do record my animals like a lot, <laughs> especially the two of them together because they don't like each other very much. So <laughs> have, having a video of them together with my piece would be very interesting. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, another question I had was with the, um, with the work, uh, this, I wasn't really clear with the bean bags. You seem to have, you know, a lot of um, different elements, and I wasn't sure if it was inside of all these elements were inside the piece or on the surface of the piece, like as drawings. Or could you please explain that to me? Oh yeah, so the the bed sheets and stuff that's all inside, and I just I needed stuff to fill it, and I thought like I didn't see the point in like buying things just for the sake of filling it when I have things that can be put inside it so like currently he's over here and he's very deflated and squished <laughs> so because all that stuff had to go back to like the dorms and like I had to use them like my bed sheets my towels my roommate stuffed animal those all had to be used so they couldn't stay in him but I I, I definitely wanted to use things that like wouldn't be permanently inside him <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so when you're looking at the piece from outside, you don't really know what's inside. Yeah, and, exactly. And I think that raised a question to me about the inside and the outside of not showing everything that's inside, but showing some of what's inside. Um, like the parts that are inside, not just that piece, but any piece that are the most resonant about this um, relationship you have, um, you know, and how you cherish and celebrate the relationship. Yeah, I feel like some sometimes the things I do get a little, the word isn't miscommunicated, but like they can be seen as like a guinea pig or a hamster, or this is just a leaf or a dandelion green. And I, I like that stuff sometimes like sometimes the stuff I do is like a little secretive like if you know you know <laughs> and I I like that it can be interpreted by like niche people like me that like guinea pigs or they're just like that's just a leaf on a wall I like I like that <laughs> okay um and so I see that you know you're wanting to take a break after after completing your studies and I'm uh, wondering if you want to take a break and then see uh, you know directions where your work is going to be continuing um I don't know that yet <laughs> I just I need I need a break for a while to just like think about my life and just slow down and like weave for fun and crochet for fun and do all these things that are fun and then figure out later what to do with all that if I'm going to do something with it and just explore textiles as a medium before really diving into it again. I am thrilled to hear that because I've been an artist for decades and sometimes I really just take a step back. Um, I will quickly swing that over <laughs> So I just make all these drawings for me. I do stuff for me that's just for fun that I don't share with the public because I need to recharge uh, my own practice or my own self or my own heart or my own being. 
um, with things that I do for me that are just for fun. And recapturing my love for drawing, my love for making, um, and not necessarily sharing any of that work with the public is what can recharge my practice or recharge me as a person, period. And so I think it's wonderful to recognize when you really need to take a break and you need to take a step back, but that you have these tools and these techniques and these knowledges that you can just elaborate on your own for yourself and uh, have fun doing it. Um, thank you for that feedback, Prabha. That was um, 10 minutes. Is there any final comments um, or questions, Jay, that you want to ask Prabha before we move to our final presenter? No, I don't think so. Just thank you for your response and thank you to anybody who listened. <laughs> thank you, Jay. Okay, our final presenter is Olivia Merck. Are you here, Olivia? Yes. Fantastic. Can everybody hear me? Yes, crystal clear. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, I will start sharing my screen. Um, is it visible? Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yes, looks good. Looks good. Awesome. Okay. Start. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Merck. I'm an individualized major. Uh, thank you all for watching my BFA conversation and for waiting until the very end. Thank you. Um, a little bit about myself. I um, was born and raised here in San Francisco, just a few blocks away from this CCA campus, actually. I used to always pretend to be a student to get discounts at Arch. Um, this is me in the backyard. I pulled uh, the sheet of paper over my head to keep the sun out of my face. Um, a little bit about my life pre-CCA, I went to a French school, and that's only important because the French school system is pretty serious about having you kind of decide what you want to do really early, and I well, had decided on science. I was in a program called Bac S, Baccalaureate Science, Bac S, um, and I was pretty set on going into the sciences until about halfway through 11th grade, where... I wasn't having a good time. It was pretty rough. I was skipping a lot of school and I ended up transferring. And at my new school, I met an amazing art teacher who kind of rekindled my love for art. And it's through him, Carlos, you know, I love him so much. It's through him that I ended up even applying to art school. And then I got into CCA. It was so close. It made so much sense. And here I am. So um, I entered into CCA as an illustration major. Um, I did a lot of characters, a lot of uh, sort of, especially cute little things I enjoyed. I did a lot of traditional art as well, traditional drawing, I, I mean, um, but all I could find for this, I'm afraid was the digital stuff. So I started in illustration, but I really was not enjoying it. I ended up switching to um, individualized and I still didn't really know what I was doing for a while until I took a couple of, um, or I took a bit really as many figure drawing classes as I could. And this really sort of cemented to me that I wanted to do something for at that time, wanted to do something having to do with the body, with the figure. And this is also right around when COVID was really seriously happening. So I was considering med medical illustration. I thought it would be something um, useful, not that I should have been uh, judging everything like that, but at the time I was for myself. Um, but even this, you know, it's not easy to get into medical illustration from an art school. You do need a science background. So I found myself in this same space of questioning what I want to do until I got to take um, my one and only science class that I've been able to take at CCA, which was with Christina La Sala, the vertebrate anatomy class. And this one really, really helped. This uh, confirmed to me that I wanted to at least go into scientific illustration um, which could also, if I choose later in life, be a springboard for medical illustration. So really quickly, some of the pieces here, this is really early work that did not end up in my thesis, but we did some joint studies. So there's two on the left. And then my final project was a coloring book because my mom was using a lot of them at the time and I wanted to make one for her. And these are both human bones as well as animal bones, pigeons on the left and a sea otter on the right. 
Um, a couple artists that are currently really inspiring my work, the first one being Mark Dion, particularly the Tate Thames Dig. I like the idea of collections, of collections sort of being evidence of history, of holes, of things like that. I had a chance to see this one in person. The photo on the right is a photo that I um, of all these shells, and I thought it was really quite amazing. Another uh, artist would be Ronnie Horn. This is uh, the Library of Water. I also had a chance to see this one in person, which was really pretty amazing. This is a piece in Iceland, and each of these columns are filled with um, melted ice from different glaciers all around the country, um, a lot of which don't exist anymore. So it's uh, in some ways very ecologically beautiful and in other ways very ecologically um, horrific. Uh, and I think this is another really interesting example of especially how artists are able to sort of bring especially ecological concerns into the forefront of sort of your thinking in a way that maybe like a standard scientific text might not be able to do. And I think it's something that it's really impressive that artists are capable of. The last person would be Gemma Anderson, who I um, reference a lot. And she wrote an entire book, very sort of manifesto-esque, about how drawing is a very important part of science and how it can be seen as a, an epistemological thing in of itself. Um, so a few things here. She works with scientists. The one on the left is uh, speculative evolution happening within a plane. So it's these sort of things becoming other things throughout a plane. The one in the middle is isomorphogenesis, which was sort of the idea of morphology, in this case, spheres between different creatures that maybe scientifically have nothing to do with each other, but can hold a lot of interest for an artist. And then the last one on the right is about string theory, which I've tried to understand, but really has evaded me. So I can't say much more on that. Um, this is where my work that I show my thesis really began. I had a chance to go to Ballybach in Ireland to the Bern College of Art for a semester. Um, the school is actually that tiny little sort of building with a tower in the photo on the left. It was one of the most amazing experiences I have been able to have, and it really changed my outlook on my art. Um, and this is what I ended up doing. So a little example or a little process snapshot. I would look for things, um, particularly in this case, this is showing some golden flatwinkles. I would arrange them in the way that I want to draw them. I would do a sketch, then I would trace that sketch, and then I would transfer that tracing with transfer paper to hot pressed watercolor paper. And then I would do all the coloring with watercolor and colored pencil. Then I would scan it and bring it into Photoshop, clean up around the edges, then bring it into InDesign to do the formatting. And I end up with this. So this was the first big one I did. These are golden flat wrinkles. Um, the next couple of pieces will all be from Ireland. These are flat wrinkles. This is a bunch of mixed shells, including, including razor clams, top shells, more flat wrinkles, an auger shell, a cowrie, limpets. Um, these are what I was told they call mermaid purses. They're actually egg sacs, egg casings. The one on the left is a skate, and the one on the right is from a dogfish. And then um, crabs, I really enjoy crabs. I had a chance to go to a beach that had a whole bunch of crab shells and broken off pieces. And this is one of my favorite pieces from that trip. The next place I was able to explore was right back home. So after coming back from Ireland, I had a bit of a new perspective. I was able to think back at home and this major super bloom was happening last year. Um, so I created some icons which um, none of this work is in my thesis, but I wanted to show it just as a sort of variation. And this was something that was especially interesting. I was working with thinking about accessibility with um, uh, scientific illustration. So I made a bunch of dry etchings that would be um, touch sensitive. So you could uh, touch the flower and sort of uh, experience it that way. Um, so I made six of these all different native wildflowers that were blooming during the super bloom. Then I was working on a little bit of my digital drawing. This is an apple branch from my backyard. And then some plain black and white drawing. So this is just a simple black and white drawing of some propagated plant cuttings that I had growing in my room. The next place I was able to be was Madison Beach in Connecticut. I was visiting a friend for her college graduation and she brought me to a beach that she used to always tell me stories about when she was a kid. I had never seen it and it was a pretty cool experience to see that different part of her life. 
And from here, I have these slipper shells, which she called boat shells, and I also kind of call them boat shells. So I had to keep remembering that that's not actually what they're called. Um, the process is the same as the ones in Ireland. Next are these jingle shells. Um, and if you hold a bunch of them in your hand and you jingle them, they make these beautiful little noises. So hence the name. The next place and the most recent sort of like amazing, like wow in my face experience was in Iceland. I had a chance to go on the Midnight Sun Summer Abroad program in Iceland, um, which uh, I was mostly thinking about rocks the entire time. And this is Petra's Stone and Mineral Collection, which is a place that we just stopped at around the trip on the island, um, which she was just an amateur scientist and enjoyed collecting. She was just an avid collector her whole life and had an entire garden full of um, specimens from pretty much the entire island. Uh, so I started gathering my own. I did not take any with me. I couldn't do that. And there is a bit of an Icelandic folktale that you'll be cursed if you do. So I didn't want to get cursed. Um, but I did come away with this. 49 rocks of Iceland. It was supposed to be 50, but I made a mistake when I was making this um, composition. So if anybody was at my show, which I'm afraid already happened, you got the 50th rock in the form of my show card. So you got a little piece of it, and I hope you took it home with you and enjoy it. So that's the 50th rock. I then came back here for last semester and this semester. Um, and I had a lot of time to spend with friends, which was really lovely. I made some more pieces. These are two sets of acorns, one with caps, one without. These are all from Healdsburg in Sonoma County. And then a bunch of dried leaves. I have a class this semester that's just walking around and sketching, and I've been enjoying seeing all the different leaves that fell, um, that have been falling recently, especially with the weird perennials of San Francisco. Last piece is these geranium leaves that I did just for my parents' backyard. And then really quickly about my final show, I thrifted and got a whole bunch of um, old frames. I fixed them up. I got new glass for some of them. I got new mats and I put all my pieces in there. I also had a small thing at the side with some of my research material, including the book by Gemma Anderson, the artist I mentioned at the beginning, and some other people along with some actual uh, specimens that I have collected and I have kept, including the mermaid's purses. And then I set it all up and this is it. And it was sadly the first week, so I cannot invite anyone there anymore, but thank you to everyone who did come. And um, I am going to get certified in scientific illustration. I've been accepted into a program in Monterey Bay and that's what I'm gonna be doing next year. So I'm all set. Thank you. Wow. Congratulations, Olivia. Congrats on your show. I saw it. It was stunning. Thank you. I uh, congrats on your talk. It was really, really engaging. And congrats on getting into that rad program at Monterey Bay. What a dream. Thank you so much. I've been um, thinking about it for like two years. Oh. Oh, I I know that Prava is like waiting to talk, but I just <laughs> want to say I love watercolors I love oh, painting you. watercolors so much and I and I love seeing the way that you handle the paint and the form and render the rocks and render the leaves and the the shells and everything in watercolor it makes me want to run home and paint thank you so much you should that's what I hope we all get to do oh my gosh just run home and paint watercolors yep um, okay Prabha take it away thank you so much um, okay, let's see. Work is it working? Uh, is the mic working? Can you hear me? I can, yes, yes. Okay, well, congratulations. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that really, really clear progression that uh, I saw. You know, it's just a great progression um, from where you, you know, began with this, you know, uh, leaving in the eleventh grade the sciences, but learned a lot about them, and then you know, moved into the arts and then, you know, went into figure drawing and, um, it, you know, it, it's a really great progression conceptually and materially, and it's really visible in the way that you explained it. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite a fantastic field. I myself absolutely love botanical illustration and actually considered getting into that field when I was young because 
it's just so beautiful. <laughs> um, so I probably own five books of botanical illustration myself because, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I find it beautiful and inspiring. <laughs> and I really found your, um, your work breathtaking, your images, and really quite developed um, in that field. Like, yes, I can see you. <laughs> you're moving right into that program and I can see why it's exactly where you should be and um, how you should uh, continue developing. Um, it's really fantastic to also be able to see where location had such an impact on you, like this, this trip to Ireland and how much it impacted your work and how open you were um, to really shifting your work or focusing your work actually and seeing yeah. what is what most inspires you and speaks to you yeah yeah um being in Ireland was also the first time I had access to a studio all to myself so I think it was just the perfect convergence of a wonderful place amazing teachers wonderful other classmates I'm dating one of them now so it all worked out really well that is fantastic it's also interesting when you show your inspirations that I could really see the, the relationship very clearly uh, between the work that inspires you and the work that you make, especially with Gemma Anderson. Mm -hmm. It was really like, okay, it's very clear how these artists um, inspire you and um, you know what that relationship is which is not one of copying at all but it's one of inspiration um and it's it's really wonderful to be so clear in uh not in the direction of your work and in uh, the direction of your imagination um as someone that studied figure drawing myself for many 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 years um it's a it's kind of an amazing process to learn about curve, line, shape, on um, all of these things. Um, and it's really wonderful that you you really understood while doing that, that that's not actually what you were going to keep developing, but it was a springboard mm -hmm. into a, a different kind of drawing and painting and working. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I really credit my figure drawing classes with helping me try to even bring a little bit of movement to something like rock. Um, I think I will hope to take them for years on end. It's really such a special um, type of art. Yes, and it's the combination of uh, science and art requires the the artist knows something about the science. <laughs> and it sounds like in your case, you have that combination. You know something about the science, so you're able to conceptually grasp, you know, the materials you're working with um, in the sciences, and then be able to do the uh, illustration work. Thank you. Is that, is, yeah. Would, yeah. Do you, would you say that that's true in your case? I, I think I don't, I don't try to um, value the scientific terminology more so than what I would just learn by sketching. I think they're both equally really important to me um, because I think there are things that I by drawing something that maybe even reading it in a book won't quite tell me, but they're both equally important. And I I really wish like that kind of um, experience of the world to everybody because it's helped me really observe more and think more and spend more time with plants and such. And it's, it's really sort of changed the way that I go outside, which has been really nice. That's uh, really great to hear. Um you know, how your senses and how you want to experience about which you are drawing. Um, and I deeply appreciated that you made these um, bright etchings mm -hmm. so that someone could experience your drawings um, in a different tactile manner. 
And I was wondering if you're also going to continue making work like that. I would, I would really love to. I, um, I've tried before, but it didn't quite work out to get in touch with the Lighthouse for the Blind here in San Francisco. And I'd love to continue to try to do that. Um, hand, hand dry etching pieces is not very sustainable for trying to make like something that could actually be used by a lot of people, but I would love it if in the future I could work together with people who have the right equipment to make, make pieces like that. Fantastic. Um, I'm sure that you'll be able to make those connections as you're going through these further program. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, programs in the Bay Area and California, uh, you know, that you could connect to um, that work around um, that kind of visual and tactile work and um, for people who are you know either blind or they're sight impaired or their sight is different right and so yeah. it, i think that's really exciting and encourage you to continue that part too well yeah. so really congratulations on this incredible progression and then following your dream <laughs> thank you <laughs> and then uh really continuing so that you can get into exactly the field that you see yourself fitting into and that really is your dream that you want to intersect with. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that concludes our BFA conversations. Um, thank you so much to our brilliant presenters. Kelsey, congratulations. Ajaya, congratulations. Tamara, congratulations. Daniela, congratulations. Olivia, congratulations. Uh, who am I missing? Jay, Jay, who's sitting right beside me. Good, good job. Congratulations. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Prabha for her amazing responses uh, and her amazing smile and it's, and her, not so amazing audio quality. <laughs> um, all right, well, I guess we're done and I'm gonna go teach my class now. So I will, if you are in my class, um, we are meeting in the gallery at five o'clock. If you are Elliot, I am meeting you in the gallery at 445. Everyone else have a beautiful evening and thank you so much. Good night.